Well, thank you. I must say, I've heard some really amazing stories uh, this evening, and so I would like to actually also tell a story, but this story is a story about the universe, and it'll last a long time. It'll start one-tenth of one billionth of a second after the universe began, and end 14 billion years later. The reason I want to tell this story is because over the past 20 years or so, our ideas about the universe have undergone a revolution. We would not be here, we believe, if the things I'm going to tell you about uh, did not happen. So a long, long time ago, 14 billion years ago, there were ripples in space and time, so small, so small, smaller than an atom, smaller than the nucleus, smaller than the things that right now we are colliding at CERN in Geneva, Switzerland, so small that it would take literally an enormous amount of energy, an entire, an entire mass of the sun, for example, to probe these scales. And yet, these tiny things are what has led to what we shall see shortly. But let me begin, however, with one of my favorite uh, paintings. This is a painting by Paul Gauguin. Apart from the fact it's a beautiful painting, a real celebration of life and the color of life, what I like about it is the title. Uh, where do we come from? What are we? And where do we wish to go? Where are we going? And what I like about this title is that, in fact, these are the questions that scientists have been trying to answer for centuries. In fact, not just scientists, but we all have. All cultures have tried to answer these questions. And the thing that's amazing to me is that over the past 80 years, scientists have actually found answers that are beginning to seem reasonable to us. So what I want to do is I want to give you, first of all, a brief story of the first draft of the story. And I shall start, actually, um, just shortly after the beginning of time. So imagine, this is one-tenth of one billionth of a second after the dawn of time. Very shortly thereafter, literally within a matter of minutes, all the matter, all the hydrogen that you see around us, the helium, the thing, the, the, just the very basic things that, of which we are made were actually created in those first three minutes. Subsequently, of course, stars grew, exploded, and their ashes became the things that actually of which we are made. So the carbon in our bodies, the oxygen, all of these things were once deep within the cores of stars. But the thing that's really quite extraordinary is that for the first 300,000 years or so, the universe was as bright as the surface of the sun, intensely bright. So bright, in fact, that light itself could not travel through this bright plasma. However, something really extraordinary happened. Around 300,000 years after the start, the universe suddenly became transparent, as if a huge shroud had been lifted. And finally, the light that was so intensely uh, jostling with each other the photons, the particles of light, actually streamed away freely. And the extraordinary thing is, this light is now reaching the Earth after a 14 billion year journey. Now, how did we discover this? Many years ago, in the 60s, two scientists, Anio and, and uh, Penzlis and Wilson, were actually doing an experiment at Bell Labs, and they saw this, uh, they found this noise in their machine and later realized that this noise was this light coming from us from very, very far away, this so-called microwave background radiation. So this intense light, this intense light that began its journey 14 billion years ago is now finally arriving here, much colder than it was when it began. Now, supposing you are floating in space, this is something I would love to do, actually. So as soon as the cost goes down to a thousand bucks, I'm, I'm game. <laughs> you'd be presented with this amazing vista. For one thing, you'd see this beautiful blue planet. The blue, of course, caused by the scattering of light from the sun. So this tells us already that there's a star nearby, which is very important to our existence. The other thing you might happen upon as you float through space is this amazing instrument, the Hubble Space Telescope. When that machine was sent up, of course, the naysayers said, oh, you know, the mirror is all destroyed and damaged, you know, what a 
terrible waste of taxpayers' money. It was fixed, of course. And it has given us a vision of the universe that's simply extraordinary. And I'm going to show you a picture that I really like a lot very soon. But perhaps the most extraordinary thing in that picture, actually, is the dark, inky darkness of space. What is space? Supposing I were to give you a box of vacuum, and I said, this box of vacuum is really, very really valuable, a million bucks, would you take it? Probably not. I would, not for a million bucks, not that rich. But whenever I travel around, you know, sitting next to me, usually there's someone who ultimately asks me, what do you do? And I say, well, I'm a scientist, I also teach. And then, of course, they probe a bit further and say, well, what do you really do? And I like to joke with them and say, I study nothing. <laughs> and sometimes they just turn away and just continue reading. <laughs> but occasionally, they will probe me further and say, what do you mean? Well, I said, because nothing is the most interesting thing there is in the universe. And it is from this nothing that we shall actually uh, come to uh, see that the structures around us came. So, why is nothing interesting? Right now, in this room, there are things which are happening that you can't see, but we can measure. There are things which have been created out of nothing and disappearing all the time. And so, in a box of empty space, everything that can happen is happening all the time. And so, if we want to understand the universe and its evolution, we need to understand nothing. However, the other thing which is very interesting about this, this picture is that if you could actually see the sky in microwaves, you would notice that in any direction you look, you look in that direction, that direction, in any direction you look, you'd see a very bright sky in microwaves. But the thing which is really strange is that the temperature of the sky in this direction, the temperature of the sky in that direction, is exactly the same. It's exactly the same to one part in a hundred thousand. Why is that strange? I've just told you, this light has been traveling towards us for 14 billion years, right? So light from this direction has taken that long to get to us. Likewise, the light from that direction has taken that long to get to us. So how on Earth or in the universe could this part of the sky have the same temperature as that part of the sky? or that part of the sky, or that part of the sky. They were never in touch with each other. So how could that happen? That's a very big puzzle. In fact, it's such a big puzzle, actually, that people thought that the story I'm telling you must be wrong. And it must be wrong in some sense, because there's a, this is a big puzzle. There's another puzzle. But let me first of all explain to you this picture. When my daughter was very young, I'm not quite sure how that arose, but she made a statement which I thought was actually very interesting. She said, Dad, infinity is a lot. That's true. And it could be that we live in a universe that's infinite, but even if that were not the case, it is very, very large. This is a picture of the nearby universe. Now, when a scientist says nearby, you have to do some rescaling. <laughs> nearby in this context means three billion light years away. That's to say, the light from these galaxies, from the furthest galaxies which we are now receiving, began its journey when the Earth, life on Earth had barely begun. Every single dot on this picture is a galaxy. Every galaxy, for example, this one, is an assembly of stars a metropolis of a hundred billion stars. I like this one in particular, the Whirlpool Galaxy, because this structure is very similar to the one that, in which we exist, the Milky Way. And in fact, if this were our galaxy, we would be actually somewhere in the suburbs, just about here. <laughs> so there are a hundred billion stars in this structure, and at last count, there are about a hundred billion galaxies. So, if I've done my sums correctly, it's 100 billion times 100 billion. That's a lot of stars. 
So the question is, how did that all come about? Where did it come from? Where did that structure come from? And that's what I want to talk about a little. But before I do that, though, I want you to notice this picture. It is true on a very large scale, the galaxy distribution is more or less uniform. But if you look closely, you'll see that there are these huge voids and these huge shells. So, in fact, the structure of the universe is such that the galaxies themselves lie on these huge sheets, these huge voids that, that, sur that surround these huge voids. And the story I've been telling you so far doesn't explain how that structure arises. So this is two puzzles. We don't know how the structure arises, and we do not know why the sky is the same temperature in this direction as it is in that direction, even though these two parts of the sky are so far apart they could possibly not have been in touch with each other during the 14 billion years since the beginning of time. So when you have such a conundrum, what do you do? You try to be like a child, and you make the obvious assumption. Well, if the sky in that direction has the same temperature as the sky in that direction, they must have been together in the past. Notwithstanding the fact that they're so far apart today, they could not communicate between each themselves. So they must have been together in the past. And that's exactly what Alan Guth said in 1981. He said, look, let's suppose that they were in fact next to each other. Then, of course, we immediately explain why the temperature is the same everywhere in the sky because they were together a long time ago. Then the question becomes, well, how do you get them from this tiny little bubble to something this large? Then, of course, is where he became insane. And he said, well, if they're that far apart and they were very close together, the universe must have expanded at such a rate to push them that far apart. When he did the calculations, he concluded that the universe would have had to expand by a factor of 10 with 30 zeros in a time that's 1 over 10 with 35 zeros, seconds. This is inflation with a vengeance, <laughs> right? So here we have this idea that a tiny micro-bubble 14 billion years ago expanded by this huge factor, 10 with 30 zeros, and so, therefore, even though these parts of the sky are so far apart, they were indeed very close together if you buy this idea of this huge inflation. So that solves that problem. Okay, it's crazy, but it's solved. <laughs> but the thing that's truly amazing to me, and for many scientists, is that in this microbubble, because this is so small, because it was so small, we know that when things become very small, you have to use a different way of thinking about the world around us an idea called quantum physics. So let's go back to our vacuum, our box of vacuum. So I told you that in a box of vacuum, on the average, there's nothing. After all, that's what a vacuum is, right? Nothing. However, if you could probe on a very, very short time scale, the vacuum is alive with activity. All kinds of things have been created and destroyed all the time. But on the average, there's nothing. Why do we know this? We know this because right now, as we speak, my colleagues at CERN are torturing protons. They're smashing them together at super high energies, at near the speed of light, and these protons, because they're so small, they can actually sense the vacuum around them. They can actually interrogate the vacuum and see what's going on. Because of this constant fluctuations in the vacuum, things coming into existence and disappearing all the time, this must have been happening way back when the universe was just this micro-bubble. Because of this huge inflation, remember, according to Alan Guth and, and his colleagues, the universe has grown from a very small micro-bubble to this huge thing, by this huge factor. Every one of these fluctuations would have been stretched by this enormous factor, 10 with, 10 th with, with 30 zeros. And so the prediction is that this structure you see here, on scales of 100 million light years, are an echo, a picture, of those microscopic fluctuations in the vacuum 14 billion years ago. 
Moreover, if you actually measure the temperature of the sky in that direction and that direction, they are very close, but not exactly the same temperature. In fact, this was done first by the COBE satellite and then by something called WMAP, a satellite in space around the Earth. What you're seeing here is a picture of the sky, the temperature of the sky, where the bright red spots are those places in the sky where the temperature is slightly larger by one thousandth of one percent of a degree. The blue patches are those parts of the sky where the temperature is slightly lower by roughly one thousandth of one degree. And this picture is a picture of the light before it became free, 400,000 years after the start of the universe. When you take this picture and you evolve it for 14 billion years and you take into account the theory of gravity that Einstein laid down, what you discover is that this structure that's been measured on the sky from 14 billion years ago describes exactly this bubble-like structure that we see for the galaxies. And so, these are, these are already echoes of something that happened way back when the universe was a microscopic bubble. These, these ripples were stretched to scales that are enormously large. These scales caused the temperature to change slightly across the sky. And finally, these slight changes in, in temperature were sufficient to cause matter to coalesce around those regions and thereby form this structure that we see today. And so, in a real sense, were it not for those ripples from way back when, we would not be here. Thank you.